Good afternoon. I'm Heidi Cray and I'm with Laura Hillman and welcome to today's session, Are You OK? Supporting Mental Health and Resilience in the Workplace. There are a couple of admin matters I'd like to address to start. First of all, hopefully you can see there's a Q&A function on the right hand side that will allow you to ask questions. Not only that will have us at the end answering them, but potentially the whole way through if we can fit them into the presentation. Please don't hesitate to add questions that you would like us to consider as we go through in the presentation. We will be recording this presentation and it will be emailed to registrants in a couple of days and recirculated. Finally, before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm currently on and to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Are You OK Day is a national annual event that we acknowledge and address for its significance. It is this year on the 10th of September. Laura and I annually also try to assist our clients understand not only that annual day, but the importance of asking, are you okay? And acknowledging and addressing the issues that can arise as employers looking after employees. 2020 has been a particularly challenging year. That is reflected in the are you okay annual importance phrase. However, as we're going to be talking about matters today, as we do each year when we do this presentation, it is about realising a couple of things. We are not doctors, and I can't see any of you when I do this presentation usually. I can generally acknowledge that most of the people who will be attending are either lawyers, managers and practitioners. I might have the occasional medical practitioners involved from time to time. But Are You OK? is about not fixing people's problems, but understanding and addressing how you may support that conversation in a workplace that could change a life. However, it's also a presentation that we are doing from the legal context of understanding as lawyers, how we can help employers, managers, and often ourselves as managers of human beings, ensure that we meet our duty of care see those risk messages and understand how you may be able to demonstrate reasonable management action while still caring for each other as human beings. So we're going to navigate that way through today as we address the topics of the developments in mental health and resilience that are coming out of COVID-19 and you would imagine and understand that they are extensive. Laura is going to walk us through the case law and the workers' compensation developments that come from that and looking at some of those red flags and behavioural issues that impact upon the duty of care, consent and treatment for the purposes of risk management and legacy issues for employers. We're going to be dealing with the practical impact of disclosures that have occurred, particularly as for the first time we are working, many of us, from home and in an environment where there's been greater disclosures than may ever have occurred before, or partial disclosures, which require greater responsibility for employers to understand and support how they will manage legally. We'll try to give you tips to build that resilience piece and understand that are you OK or identifying support is not necessarily a one-off conversation but equally, it is not necessarily always a cry for significant and deep intervention. Sometimes it can be that people are just having a rough time and knowing that people care about them and that there are other support structures in place are important. Finally, we'll be dealing with responding to and defending legal claims that may arise by reason of the COVID-19 pandemic and legacy issues. It wouldn't be a good presentation from Laura and I if we didn't have the snapshot of memes that are coming out of the pandemic. I personally love the chilly one. I think it is a good piece of medical advice regarding if your grandma said don't rub chilli on your hands and then touch your face, you know, what do we think will uh, happen with a con consequential COVID-19 health warning? However, it also reflects some of the impact around 
how people may add humour into dealing with difficult situations. And as a parent of a child that has been sent home now three times because he has allergies, as opposed to a fever or any other symptom, I do have to uh, empathise and understand the COVID cat response that may have actually been caught mid-cough um, mm -hmm. in dealing with an issue that everyone may otherwise unfortunately consider as something else. What does that tell us? It tells us that there are so many issues that are pulling us in terms of the impact on us as individuals and also as managers. The uncertainty is, and the distress that might follow does not just come from the potential risk of being infected. There are so many issues that have the capacity to impact upon somebody's health and well-being, personally and at work. And in circumstances now, for the first time perhaps in our lifetimes that it has emerged into this way, the two are blending significantly. And Laura will be unpacking the impact of what is the workplace as we move forward. But as the slide identifies, and it is a heavy and congested slide of influences, as when I sat down with Laura, I went, there's so much more. Uncertainty in employment, changing health directives. I'm on the email list, as I'm sure most of you are, for the updates in your states and territories regarding changes to health directives and the advices that might come out. The inability to travel. And for those of us who used to focus so significantly on travel, the loss and grieving that you feel that there won't be those holidays, there won't be that family catch up and connection. The constant negative media barrage. I don't know how many worse days we have had in Victoria and the impact of how many more escalating and emotional comments that come from the media which add to people's sensitivity and the impact that it can have on them. Access to goods and services, disruption of their normal routines, their physical exercise, not being able to see friends, uh, ongoing uncertainty, changing workplace expectations, location, work outputs, inconsistent medical information, including the benefits of certain medications, the benefits of wearing masks, the benefits of a variety of different things which continue to be debated worldwide. And of course, last but not least, the impact of working from home, which we addressed earlier in the month in our um, session on the changes that were occurring. As a result, so much uncertainty will add to the impact of distress in the workplace where employees may not actually be comfortable listening and dealing with the barrage of information about how safe they are in returning to work and dealing with, as we said in our earlier session, the impact of perception versus reality and the health assessments and COVID health plans that are necessary to support education and awareness, but also transition back into the workplace where that is occurring. However, this dislocation has people feeling isolated. It has people exposed to a workplace that is now their home workplace, which could include also domestic and family violence concerns. You might find from excessive video conferencing, whether or not that is Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams and the many other platforms that suddenly we are using that we may never have previously relied upon to such an extent that people are dropping off, that people are switching their cameras off, that people are not engaged. The social and lack of social interaction and how you can make those happy, light moments of brevity that can occur in a workplace in social interaction between colleagues is significantly affected by the current environment. So those impacts are going to add to the issues of job rate unemployment, 7.5% nationally. The bill released, I think, an hour and a half earlier today to Parliament regarding JobKeeper amendments. What will this mean? Will we have further redundancies and restructures? Significant industries being affected and sectors that are caught in the spiral of uh, access, teaching, consequential impact. Those changes, each of them, will all add to a person's capability of bouncing back 
of being resilient and necessarily being able to cope with all of the stressors that ordinary everyday life may present to them. So it is hardly surprising as we look at the statistics that are currently coming out that there has been an increase in relation to access to services in our community that are dedicated to support those in relation to the impact of health, wellbeing, counselling and support. Beyond Blue being one of those organisations has increased and identified an increase of access to its services by 60%. In addition to that, there are significant uh, comparable reports occurring through a variety of uh, mechanisms, including, as outlined on the slide, reports in May 2020 of the study of the impact of psychological distress amongst people working through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The study identified that 76% of people were reporting moderate or severe psychological distress, whereas 31% were recording severe psychological distress. Equally in May, the Sydney Brain and Mind Centre included some modelling on the consequential impact of what could occur in the event that there was a 12-month uncertainty in relation to the current lockdown environment. That modelling is a prediction and an opportunity which has the capacity to change. But the modelling identified that there is likely to be a 25% increase of suicide related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result, there are many, including the AMA, that is cause, calling for greater intervention in the healthcare sector, mental health care sector, and also government for funding and support and intervention to bring those prevention steps into play particularly as this is not something that is going to be over, as everyone hoped, by September, but may actually continue on for longer. In addition to that, there has been a consequential impact in the number of domestic violence incidents. In May also, there was a survey of 15,000 women that identified that one in 10 were experiencing some form of domestic violence, and two-thirds of them had flagged that it was becoming worse during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Now, you will have noticed that one of the most significant and early stage changes to each of the public health directions was the exemptions in relation to domestic and family violence. Those exemptions continue to be promoted, as do the many organisations that provide additional government, state and federal support for the initiatives of supporting those affected by health, excuse me, by domestic and family violence. Last but not least, given the nature of our discussion today legally, will be on the duty of care and reasonable management action issues and legacy items that come will be the impact on workers' compensation claims. The most significant issues that are arising at present are what is a workplace? And of course, as Laura will take us through, the impact of working from home and how people are working from home is changing further again that breadth and the blurring of lines of people engaging in activities, obviously at work, but in their domestic residence. The uncertainty and the perception issues and the resilience and capability of employees also will have an impact of potential increase for workers' compensation claims. At the moment, we do not have much accessible data as to what is occurring as most of the states and territories have not released that data yet, other than Victoria. Victoria, as at the 30th of July, had indicated in their statistics that they've had 111 claims related to coronavirus approved, 33 were based on contracting coronavirus, and 78 were accepted on other, such as mental health grounds, related to the pandemic. I would now like to hand over to Laura to take you through the legal components of our session today, the legislative amendments and, of course, the case law developments which support the issues regarding duty of care and reasonable management action. Thanks, Hedy. And on the meme front, well, Hedy might like the chilli one the best. I think social distancing cat is a winner for me and uh, I would like to see one given to every person. 
I think it might make it, I think it'd be a wonderful initiative. <laughs> um, in all seriousness though, one of the developments that has emerged from the pandemic uh, is presumptive legislation in relation to COVID-19. New South Wales has amended its Workers' Compensation Act to provide that when a worker engaged in prescribed employment contracts COVID-19, it's presumed unless the contrary is established that the worker contracted it in the course of their employment and this automatically entitles them to workers' compensation. What this means that is that unless the insurer finds that the worker's COVID came from another source um, unrelated to work, such as if they contracted it at the home, um, they will uh, be deemed to have a work-related injury and receive compensation. It's not for all workers. Prescribed employment relevantly includes the healthcare sector, including ambulance officers and public health employees. As also mentioned on the slide, in Western Australia, an amendment bill was passed last week um, and it's been assented to, to provide for similar um, provisions. In South Australia, a similar bill was also introduced, how it has not been passed yet. So this is very much a watch the space area. In Queensland, unrelated directly to COVID-19, but still very relevant to our discussion around mental health, an amendment bill has been introduced to provide presumptive compensation to first responders and other eligible employees in relation to PTSD. So where an eligible employee suffers post-traumatic stress disorder, it will be presumed to be work-related unless there is evidence to the contrary. Eligible employees include police officers, correction services officers, ambulance officers, firefighters and doctors and nurses. This bill is currently before the committee. Also in Queensland, amendments that were passed last year, as mentioned on the slide, are now in effect. Some changes came into effect on 30 October last year and others have commenced on 1 July this year, such as the amendment to um, now include unpaid interns as being uh, covered by workers' compensation legislation. Those changes also removed the distinction between psychiatric and psychological um, disorders and other injuries in the definition of injury. So no longer since 30 October 2019 does employment need to be the major significant contributing factor for a psychiatric injury to be compensable, but the same as with physical injuries, employment just needs to be a significant contributing factor. From 1 July, self-insurer obligations are now aligned with those insured by work cover in relation to provision of information um, to the insurer. There is also now a further ability for the insurer to waive the six month application time limit for making a claim. The test is that the worker needs to make a claim within six months of the injury being assessed by a doctor and there are limited grounds for work cover to waive that time limit. The time frame runs even if the doctor doing the assessment doesn't certify any incapacity. However, the time frame can now be waived if the insurer is satisfied that a doctor has assessed the injury as resulting in total or partial incapacity for work and the claimant lodged the application within 20 business days after the first assessment. On the slide, we've summarised some of the other changes, including that there is now a new part dealing with support for workers with psychiatric or psychological injuries while the claim is being assessed, um, and that's now in effect. So an area that has impacted a lot more workplaces during the pandemic on a greater scale is what Heidi mentioned, working from home. Well, working from home is not a new creation uh, from the pandemic. It has required many workplaces to quickly adapt, to have as many employees as possible working from home. And even where people are now returning to the workplace, depending on what part of Australia you're in, there is an increase of employees uh, wanting to work from home or uh, continuing to work from home, either in a full-time or part-time basis. As we all know, a person conducting a business or undertaking must ensure, so far as, as reasonably practicable, the health and safety of workers at the workplace. Working from home can blur the lines between what is a workplace and what is home, and home can become the workplace and employers will owe them a duty of care. This provides risks not only for workplace health and safety, but also for workers' compensation. So in considering whether it's safe for an employee to work from home, different considerations include is it clear what is actually the workplace? Is it limited to the home office or the house at large? Are there domestic and family violence risks? 
Is the work area appropriate and are there trip hazards as well as ergonomic issues? And how will support and supervision be addressed to manage work stress and ensure workers aren't working excessive hours? Case law is also clear that an injury that occurs at a place an employer encourages or requires an employee to be at, including if it is away from their usual place of employment, can be found to arise in the course of employment. However, it is necessary for the activity engaged in by the employee causing the injury to be an activity that the employer induced or encouraged the employee to do or was reasonably required, expected or authorised to be done in order to carry out the duties. Also, just to flag, different states have different legislation regarding workers' compensation and so how place of employment is defined um, may differ. Over the years, what we've seen from case law is that many working from home injury cases arise from temporary absences during ordinary recesses, such as during a lunch break or going to the bathroom. Also, injuries that arise during an interval or during an overall period of work can be work injuries, even if the employee wasn't engaging in work tasks at the time. So on this slide and the following slide, we've set out some examples to demonstrate how the courts and commissions um, deal with these uh, concepts. In the Queensland case of Farnham and Pruden, the Court of Appeal found the Workers' Compensation Rehabilitation Act in Queensland did not apply to the injury sustained by Ms Farnham. She was a community support worker who visited foster homes and attended to the administrative aspects of her role from her home office. And she was injured in a car accident traveling between her home and a foster home. In looking at the definitions of home and place of employment under workers' compensation legislation, the Court of Appeal found a worker's home does not cease to be a home because the worker does some work from it, but also working from home does not turn it into a place of employment, especially as it was not ever truly occupied nor under the control or management of her employer in relation to her specific claim. For employment to be considered a significant contributing factor, what the worker does in the course of employment and the requirements of the role must contribute in some significant way to the occurrence of the injury. In Demacy and Comcare, being injured while going for a run at a random time while working from home was found not to be in the course of employment. However, in Hargraves and Telstra, being injured while coughing and walking down the stairs to get cough medicine and to lock the door was found to be connected to employment as the actions leading to the injury constituted a necessary absence or ordinary recess due to the worker's medical condition and needing to lock the door was akin to a toilet break or a break that ordinarily would occur if she's at the workplace. In workers' compensation, nominal insurer and Hill, the New South Wales Court of Appeal found that the employee who worked from home and was killed by her partner who was suffering from delusions was killed in the course of her employment as the physical attack materialised as a result of a hostile work environment created by the partner who was incidentally also her co-worker and the employee died at a time when she was available to attend to work calls or other work matters in the course of her employment. In particular, the evidence reflected that the worker often worked earlier or later in, uh, her, than her scheduled hours and would make herself uh, available outside of hours for work. And a question has um, popped up, um, how does DFE, I assume that means domestic and family violence, a risk for the employer. Um, and an example of that is the case we just uh, discussed then in the Hill matter. Um, what it turns on is not necessarily what the injury is itself or you know, who may have been involved in causing the injury, but whether the employee was in the course of employment when the injury was sustained. So if you are actually performing work, and um, there is you know, violence, um, as was found in the Hill decision, that could be in the course of employment, especially in this case when the worker worked quite flexible hours um, and there was evidence to demonstrate that um, she would often make herself available to perform work outside of what would be seen as ordinary hours. And in Comcare and PBYW, which is more commonly known as the motel sex case. Um, the worker was injured while on a work trip at the hotel, which was paid for by her employer. She was having sex and suffered a serious injury when a glass light fitting fell on her face. 
The High Court, in finding the injury was not work-related, reinforced that an inducement or encouragement to be at a particular place does not provide the necessary connection to employment merely because an employee is injured while engaged in an activity at that place. The activity engaged in by the employee also needs to have been encouraged or induced by the employer, and in this case, it was definitely not. And following the same reasoning in that decision, there is the case this year of Lee in Brighton, Australia, where an employee was injured when intervening in a fight to assist his colleague while at a restaurant for dinner. The injury was found not to be compensable as the employer didn't encourage or approve the employee going to a specific restaurant and most certainly did not approve or encourage intervention in a fight. Where an employee works from home or at the workplace, employers must be alert to risks and continue to engage in reasonable management action. Areas for mental health um, that Haiti flag can include returning employees to the workplace, working from home, workload and changes to work, complaints and conflict and disclosures. And I'll take you through some of those in more detail now. Returning employees to the workplace can have um, risks to mental health. Some employees may be very happy and have been really looking forward to coming back um, to the office. Others may be more apprehensive or just simply prefer working from home. To manage this, it's important to be clear regarding what steps the business is taking to ensure compliance with health directives, as well as to support health and safety. A question that's arisen during the pandemic is, what if an employee says they cannot return to the workplace um, as they are in a vulnerable category and believe they're at a greater risk of contracting COVID um, and they may have a medical certificate? In addressing this situation, communication is key. You are not challenging a medical certificate if one is provided by simply asking for more information to ask what it means, including why the employee and or their doctor believe they are vulnerable to greater risk. Even if you obtain further information, assess the risk and find the employee isn't actually at risk, it's still important to engage with them and address this, including to understand and hear their concerns, um, address them, provide reassurance, including to reinforce the steps that the workplace is taking to ensure the um, health, um, safety and wellbeing of the employee. Work changes, in particular during challenging times like this, can be inevitable, including as a result of deliberate steps taken by management, but also more indirectly, such as the effects of um, people leaving and not being replaced. It's important to be aware of employees' workloads and the impacts that changes can cause, including to ensure that people are not overloaded and to keep in mind that where there are concerns about job security, some employees might not actually let managers know that they are struggling. While occurring before the pandemic, the case of Weatherburn and Comcare demonstrates how this can occur. In this case, the workers' team was gradually reduced until she was the only team member. However, workloads weren't adjusted, so she began to work long hours and take work home. Resources were again reduced, and when she asked for a higher duties allowance, this was rejected. Now, these changes didn't happen quickly. This occurred over a seven-year period. The straw that broke the camel's back appeared to be when she made a mistake um, in a document and her director's reaction um, caused her great distress. The worker made a claim and it was accepted. But so significant were the impacts of the gradual changes resulting in excess workload that when Comcare ceased compensation after the worker was receiving benefits for five years, the worker was able to successfully challenge that decision and benefits were resumed. This can be compared to the case of University of Tasmania and S, where the employer successfully overturned a decision to pay the worker weekly compensation. The worker alleged she suffered a psychiatric injury due to being subjected to an excessive workload. The employer actually agreed that the workload was probably excessive. However, once this was identified, the employer took very prompt steps to address it, including reallocating tasks and bringing in more resources. The employer also successfully demonstrated that the worker was aware of the job demands, was not asked to work beyond normal work hours, and was regularly encouraged to go home on time. As a result, while there was probably an excessive workload, identifying and dealing with it promptly meant that the employer's actions were found to be reasonable and the subsequent injury that developed was not compensable. 
While our work locations may be different and times may be challenging, requirements regarding procedural fairness and compliance with policies and procedures have not changed. This includes not blurring processes even where the employee may be conflating issues. In Vice and Workers' Compensation Regulator, the employee made a workers' comp claim for a psychiatric injury he said arose from a catch-up with his regional manager, where he says he was ambushed in the meeting with unfair accusations that he stole from the employer by taking his earned time off in lieu without obtaining proper approval. He also claimed the manager was hostile and brought up his performance and told him he was the worst venue manager in the region, which he said had never been raised previously. The workers' appeal was rejected, with the Commission finding that the manager's concerns were not baseless and the worker had recently been reminded of the employer's requirements regarding toil, but still failed to comply with accepted practices. The manager said he didn't mean for the meeting to move on to performance, but the worker, in trying to avoid the issue of discussing the toil concern, um, actually uh, highlighted areas regarding performance, which the manager didn't agree with, and so he was drawn into having that discussion. The commissioner accepted this and found that overall the manager's actions were reasonable. However, it would have been preferable for the manager to avoid being drawn into the discussion regarding performance. A common mistake made by employers is assuming that a formal complaint needs to be made before anything can be done. If you become aware of work conflict, even if it seems petty or low level, you do not need to wait before it becomes serious and turns into a complaint or even a claim. Addressing conflict proactively and early can often stop matters escalating, but also commences reasonable management action that you can rely on if a claim is made. An example of how low-level conflict, if not managed properly, can escalate is the New South Wales case of this year of BB and Secretary Department of Education, where BB was found to have a compensable psychiatric injury arising from a conflict with a colleague who we also supervised um, and shared an office with. BB requested a separate office, as sharing an office he claimed affected his ability to do his job properly, as the co-worker spread her resources all over the office, spoke on the telephone in a loud manner, put boxes and other items on his desk, put the ceiling fan on high, and opened and closed the office door abruptly and aggressively. BB said that when he followed up on his request for another office, um, this was ignored, but when his employer did respond to it, um, it gave him the option of relocating to another office, which upset him because he said, why should he have to be the one who moves? While that conflict at its core was low level, because the employer did not step in promptly to address it, uh, they were not able to rely on the reasonable action exemption under the Act, and the claim was accepted. Disclosures can come in a range of ways, including from complaints, during difficult processes, or even the employee just telling you. However, disclosures are often not initiated by an employee providing you with helpful information and a clear explanation of what is occurring, but rather from concerns arising from their behaviour. This includes crying, sudden mood changes, declining performance and out-of-character behaviour, but also more subtle behaviour, such as sending emails at very late hours. This can be hard to navigate and approach. In particular, identifying issues can be harder when supervising employees remotely, as there can be fewer opportunities to observe behaviour if interactions are limited to phone, video conference and email. So for example, an employee could be very upset but switches the camera off, um, so you can't see that they've been crying. Like with a physical medical condition, an employee is only required to disclose that they have a mental health condition if it impacts their ability to safely perform the inherent requirements of the position. In approaching these issues, re again, reasonable management action is the key. It's important to keep in mind considerations such as the basis for the request, such as if you're seeking disclosure due to uh, workplace health and safety or duty of care concern, as well as privacy, such as making sure um, confidential information is kept secure, limiting access to that information and ensuring the purpose of the request is communicated clearly to the employee. Communication is a two-way street, and employees too have an obligation to make disclosure. 
This is reinforced in decisions such as Laviano and the Fair Work Ombudsman, which is an excellent decision and a favourite of Hades and mine, involving a general protections claim. Mr Laviano brought a general protections claim against his former employer after he was dismissed for failing to attend six medical assessments and failing to communicate with his employer during his extended absence from work um, due to a psychological condition. Mr Laviano alleged that the reason for him not communicating with his employer was that it was on the advice of his doctor who said, do not open daily mail and do not communicate with the employer. Unsurprisingly, he didn't communicate that to his employer. In rejecting Mr Laviano's claim, the judge accepted that there were periods of time that Mr Laviano could not uh, work due to his illness. However, he did not accept that Mr Laviano was unable to communicate with his employer or that there was evidence to establish that his disability prevented him from attending the medical assessment. The judge also found that while there were periods when Mr Laviano did not communicate with his employer on medical advice, he failed to relay that to his employer. And handed down last week is the case of Christine Hudson and RMIT University, where the Fair Work Commission rejected Dr Hudson's unfair dismissal claim. Um, Dr Hudson was a media and communications lecturer of more than 26 years tenure whose employment was terminated on the basis that she could no longer perform the inherent requirements of her job after being absent for 13 months due to illness. Now, this case is quite the saga of the university attempting to engage with Dr Hudson to seek information about her fitness for work and Dr Hudson refusing to cooperate and instead embarked upon a path of criticising her employer, making a complaint after asserting that any further attempts to pressure her to provide information was bullying and harassment, requesting a change of supervisor. Um, she also edited the IME consent form and when told it would not be accepted, attended the IME anyway with the edited form, which of course could not be used and the IME could not proceed. The university paper trailed the steps it um, took and, and uh, took a range of steps to um, engage and address the matters that uh, Dr Hudson was throwing their way, including considering and addressing the complaint, um, providing her with a temporary change of supervisor, um, and also when it came to the stage of providing a show cause letter, they provided a very detailed letter that set out the history and steps taken um, and advised that the university was considering terminating her employment under the fitness for work provisions of their enterprise agreement, which as was found when the claim was made, they had complied with. Dr Hudson responded to the letter but did not address the matters um, in the show cause or provide a medical report. The university provided her with another opportunity to address its concerns and provide a medical report as well as to meet and discuss the matter. Dr Hudson again responded but didn't address what was being asked nor met with them. After Dr Hudson refused a third opportunity to meet, the university proceeded to make a decision and terminated her employment. Dr Hudson's unfair dismissal claim was unsuccessful and the Commission was quite scathing of her behaviour. The Commission found that the university's decision to terminate Dr Hudson's employment was soundly based and defensible and that the university provided multiple opportunities for Dr Hudson to provide evidence and was flexible, lenient and willing to accommodate alternatives so she could demonstrate her fitness. In finding that the university showed, and I quote, incredible latitude, seeking no more than was stipulated under their enterprise agreement, Dr Hudson acted as though this was a game of semantics, one she could engage in until she wore RMIT staff down and or achieved her own objective and returned to work. While Dr Hudson's complaint was responded to before the scheduled IME, the Commission said uh, the complaint would not have provided a valid ground for non-attendance anyway. The Commission also found that Dr Hudson showing up to the IME, bringing a modified consent form she knew would be unacceptable, was a refusal to attend. Commissioner Bissett said the difference between refusing to sign any consent form and signing and presenting a consent form that she knew would be rejected is non-existent in practical effect and to suggest that she was willing to attend but only on her own terms is a refusal to attend an IME as required. 
So if a manager is on notice that there may be issues with an employee, there is no need to wait for proactive disclosure to come from the employee. Consistent with your duty of care, you can ask. However, how you ask is important, as just asking if an employee has a mental illness um, could amount to a breach of discrimination legislation, but also is unlikely to help you um, get the information that you need to address your concerns. It is important to focus on the behaviour that has given rise to the concerns, not what you think might be the cause. Also consider what information do you need? Is this a situation where you might need to request a medical clearance from the doctor, or is it an informal discussion to see how the employee is going, checking in and discussing with them, for example, that you know, you, you've seen that they're not as happy as they used to be, or they seem concerned about something, or you know, they're sending emails at very strange hours. Um, is there also support that can be provided in the meantime while you're obtaining information? Support is not just by reminding employees that you have an employee assistance program. You know, while that is still an important step, um, think about what other support could be provided, such as, you know, is this um, a an appropriate situation for reallocating tasks or encouraging some time off. And crucially, um, and when saying it's not just as lawyers, make sure that you keep a good paper trail and notes such as um, of your discussions, what disclosures have been made, support that was offered and confirming matters in writing with the employee such as requests for information and any directions provided. If you need medical information to understand the employee's fitness for work, it's important to consider who the information should be sought from, as are you satisfied with information from the employee themselves or information from their doctor, or is this a situation where an um, IME might be more appropriate? You don't need to just pick one option. Depending on the situation, it might be appropriate to do all three and, for example, use the information from the employee and their own doctor to brief an IME doctor who's a specialist. If you're obtaining information from the employee's doctor, uh, the employee's consent is needed. And in obtaining information or sending an employee for an IME, be sure to look at your contracts and enterprise agreements, which may deal with such requests. But even if they don't, requests can still be made um, as lawful and reasonable directions. If sending an employee for an IME, make sure you've chosen a doctor from the appropriate specialty. Sometimes um, it can be more than one doctor. And make sure the briefing is appropriate. Don't assume the doctor understands your concerns, your workplace, um, or the employee's role. Um, a briefing that is deficient in those areas can result in the doctor basing their opinion purely on what the employee has told them. And if the report you receive is not clear and does not address what you have requested, um, ask again. Just looking at that yeah. additional question that has come in, that Laura was just outlining the impact of contracts, enterprise agreements and lawful and reasonable directions. Safety will always be an inherent requirement in the employment relationship. The degree to which, as the question asked, when can you direct somebody to undertake an IME if you don't have a contract or enterprise agreement is going to obviously depend on the facts. However, for it to be lawful and reasonable, it will need to be based on an inherent safety issue, which if you have paper trailed, as Laura outlined, the consents, the requests and the circumstances, it may be otherwise appropriate to direct them to undertake an IME. If they refuse, then you may very well have a Laviano case, which as Laura indicated, is one of our favourite cases. <laughs> So then all this leads to the question, how do we create and maintain a mentally healthy workplace? We've all been through many challenges this year, and it's important to remember we are all trying our best, learning as we go, and there is no one size fits all. However, a good starting point is resilience, which can be defined um, as your ability to cope with tough times uh, by applying your inner strength and engaging support networks. Resilience can enable you to face difficult situations and maintain good mental health. But as we know, resilience can be impacted by many things, both work and not work related. And even the definition itself, you know, 
um, assumes that uh, resilience is impacted by other people, including your access to support. Um, and as we know, resilience on its own is not enough. As we all have different levels of resilience, it can also be supported and built up, but also eroded. Workplace culture and leadership plays an important role in supporting and building resilience. Leaders need to model the behaviour they expect of others. This can be done by ensuring complaints and concerns are addressed, complying with workplace policies and ensuring that work areas are safe and enable people to perform their roles. Workplace uncertainty can create a lot of stress, so it's important that leaders are clear and consistent in communications, encourage and address questions, and acknowledge that different people can feel differently about different actions. That someone's unhappy about an action doesn't mean that action is wrong, but acknowledging that they may not be happy um, and addressing this can go a long way to either bringing them on board, um, but also demonstrating reasonableness. It also goes both ways. It's important that managers also take care of themselves and receive support, and employees also treat managers with respect and courtesy. Managing mental health matters in the workplace requires balance and reasonableness. Be clear on expectations and management action. Supportive, but not blur the line, and seek medical information, as we've discussed, where it is necessary to understand fitness and capacity. Involve your human resources and workplace health and safety teams early in the process if you need support. Don't wait for a difficult matter to become a claim um, before you, you're first calling HR. To ensure effective communication strategies, especially for discussions that you know will be difficult, plan and prepare. This can include brainstorming, even just with yourself, um, what reaction um, might occur during the meeting um, and how you will respond to it, such as if the employee becomes very angry or cries or just doesn't engage. Um, and also think of what questions you might be posed in the meeting so that you're ready with an answer. And also, again, think about what support can be provided um, to support mental health. And if you receive a claim, engage with the process and respond. Don't leave it until you receive an adverse decision or you're looking at a court process before doing anything. It's important to keep in mind that for workers' compensation claims, different states have different processes um, and different tests. It, whatever your state's process is, it's important to participate and respond, including to ask for details up front from the insurer about what has been alleged. When responding, don't assume the decision maker knows your business or what actually occurred or that they will investigate in the way that you would. They are initially guided by what the claimant is alleging. Responding is the opportunity for the business to tell its story and provide relevant evidence. Don't just limit it to saying you deny the claim, but set out the context, including regarding the employee's role, your workplace, and what steps were taken, what support was provided, and provide relevant documents. And if you receive an adverse decision, consider your appeal options. Many appeal options in workers' compensation don't require going to court at first instance, but are review processes. When considering an appeal, it's important to consider commercial considerations, including the impact on your insurance premium. If a claim is accepted, you can talk to your customer contact at the insurer to get information about what the impact um, is. If an appeal process goes to a hearing, including if it proceeds to common law, there are also reputation considerations if a decision is published, such as in cases such as Hinkston Construction Engineering, which involved an employee alleging he suffered a psychiatric injury as a result of, amongst other things, his supervisor farting in his direction. While the employer was successful overall, there is a published decision for all the world to see addressing the flatulence habits of the workplace. And if a claim made is not a workers' compensation claim, such as if you've received a claim as the you know, owner of the premises or another type of claim, such as discrimination, look at your insurances and consider notifying your insurer early. If a claim is made, importantly, this does not prevent you from addressing matters with your employee. If they remain employed by you, a workers' compensation claim being made does not prevent you from continuing to address matters, including regarding performance and conduct, so long as it is reasonable to do so. 
that an employee is not fit for work also doesn't stop you from contacting them or having them contact you, as we discussed in the Laviano case. If the claim is a workers' compensation claim, be sure to engage with your insurer and support return to work, um, regardless, and regardless of whether the claim is accepted, matters in the claim still need to be managed and reasonable management action continued. I'll now hand you back to Haiti to discuss getting ready for Are You OK Day? Thank you, Laura. As Laura outlined, as the platform of the many things that managers and leaders of organisations need to address, the issues of reasonable management action and understanding when some of those red flags and issues need to be addressed from performance management, a paper trail and a medical evidence position can obviously give rise to a range of additional steps that need to be taken. Some of the questions that have come in highlighted that including the question about how can an employer be responsible for domestic and family violence when that is occurring at home. And the challenge is, of course, that employers are now not only, as Laura highlighted, getting more information through disclosures that might occur, but equally that the workplace that is now at home will expose them to risks and risk assessments need to consequentially also consider that impact just as any other work health and safety responsibility for a work assessment would be where a worker is required to work. So some of these things, of course, go into the complex nature of understanding how people react and what might be occurring. One of the questions that came in was about when an employee might refuse to deal with workplace conflict due to the medical re reasons or the records. And I think that the university RMIT matter was a very good example of explaining how the paper trail was addressed in relation to managing those employees. The in, in concerns, the issues around paper trail obviously needs to be proportionate to what the issues are. The question in relation to using public transport and whether it's reasonable to require them to come into the office comes back to, again, those COVID health and safety plans that I alluded to earlier in the session, and namely where you are and whether or not you're at a stay home order or capable of using public transport. Workplaces are actually now some of the safest places for many in the country to be attending in circumstances where the responsibilities for addressing COVID safety plans are paramount on every employer's mind. However, public transport and the ease of accessing public transport and reasonableness for directions will go to understanding what the employee's concerns are because talking to them and listening to those concerns might alleviate some of the concern or stress that they might be feeling about catching public transport, particularly in circumstances where they may also be moderating their behaviour for supermarkets or wearing their own personal PPE and addressing public transport could be available to them as well as accessing different times on public transports and flexible work practices potentially in relation to coming in earlier or later to avoid peak hours if there are reasonable concerns and no ability to socially distance, et cetera, in relation to those matters. So as you can understand, in dealing with those legal complexities and the questions that naturally for supervisors and managers form part of our everyday lives, and everyday clients' questions that come to Laura and I, the issue of thinking about Are You OK Day is that one conversation and the opportunity that faces us as human beings that you may see somebody who is engaging in a way that their life's ups and downs may just be getting to them. And the opportunity as good human beings to be able to reach out to somebody and say, Are You OK? That is the platform for the initiative that is Are You OK Day? And it is that platform, as I outlined, which in 2020 has the takeaway line of it's more than just this one of saying it needs to be more than once. Of course, it is, as I outline on the slide, being able to ask somebody um, how they are is not ignoring those warning signs. It is being prepared <laughs> for when the person might say no. And therefore, it's understanding that, are you in a fit and able state ready yourself to be asking those questions? Are you mentally prepared for what happens if they say no? Do you have enough time to devote to the person? And 
in the event that the issues that Laura has been discussing are all on the table, be careful to think about how you might still want to be a human being and not blur the lines in relation to just checking in with them as opposed to that ongoing performance management or conflict management or medical assessment piece. How you might choose to have a conversation, how you might try and support someone confidentially and privately to just check in with them also becomes about planning your language and ensuring that you are not engaging in conduct which might be seen to trivialise the impact of the matter or not listen to those concerns that an employee might have. There's been a lot of uh, communications that are circulating in preparation for RUOK Day to think about the language that you use. Of course, listen without judgment is one of the platforms of Are You OK? But not trying to be um, dismissively positive and saying, it'll be OK, buck up, she's all right, you'll get on with it, may not actually be the right way to listen to an individual who needs your support and understanding that sometimes just listening and asking them, how can I best support you with this, might be all that you can do in addition to then going away, following up and thinking about other support mechanisms that might need to be available as outlined on the slide. Fundamentally though, as we lead into our UAK day, we do need to ask ourselves how we are going to best refresh and reset for this year because whilst it's a significant day, it is not the only day that we should be checking in with each other and checking in with ourselves to ensure that we have an understanding of the impact that all of these things that have been occurring in our community, in our media, in our workplaces are going to impact upon everybody in some way, shape or form. Realising that self-care is important, helping to build ways to identify your own resilience before you can actually try to help others is a very important message as we take away leading into Are You OK Day? Please don't actually wait to deal with that. Whether it's self-care or watching red flags, you need to act on them. You cannot just turn a blind eye to these events and circumstances that are occurring around you. There are many opportunities that we will have now and into the future to refresh and reset and think about ensuring that we are looking after ourselves and our employees and our organisations in addressing the matters compassionately and appropriately and where necessarily legally through the paper trail as Laura has outlined today. And fundamentally as we wrap up, there are a number of significant community support initiatives which exist in relation to providing people with health, wellbeing and mental health concerns access to additional support where we may not be able to provide them in our conversations as leaders and managers. Those are outlined on the slides and are always important to ensure as some of the techniques and tools that we might circle back to employees on that there are others who are also well equipped to support and address the needs of those who might need a little bit more at this time. Just checking in guys. We've reached our time and I think we have reached our questions. Unless there's any other questions that are coming through, Laura and I would like to say thank you very much for joining us on the session and fundamentally as we move forward in relation to are you okay, look after yourself and look after your staff and do your best as we all are to find ways to help return to some balance against all of those influences of uncertainty because a moment for yourself will be a blessing in the long term for you to be able to help others. Take care.